One of the things you can plot with almost 100% accuracy is that if we've had a good councillor in an area, your vote will go up because people have seen Greens in action. And I can tell you when I first started campaigning and I went and door knocked around Fitzroy and North Fitzroy, I never I heard quite so much positive feedback from people as I did about Kathleen. Like people had seen what Kathleen had done and, kn and knew that she was there representing the community and knew that when she was in a position of having to exercise power, she'd exercise it on principle and for the benefit of the community. Um, but when I worked most closely with Kathleen was, was in 2010, in the 2010 election campaign. And it was that spirit of I mean, community that um, we saw in... Uh, people perhaps know most prominently from our campaign uh, that people-powered campaign was actually devised and generated by Kathleen. And I remember as we were sitting around thinking about how to um, campaign, thinking, oh, maybe we need a billboard or maybe we need this leaflet there. Kathleen was talking about organising dinner parties and saying cocktail parties and saying that what we need to do is actually take politics back to its basic principles. And let's remind people that politics is about people and about conversations. And um, we had the benefit of working together through the course of 2010, and that changed the way that we campaigned in, in Melbourne, and we won. Unfortunately, that came at a price because our success, probably Kathleen was probably the first victim of our success, because the Liberals looked at that and said, oh, hang on, these Greens could actually get into power. We don't actually like that. As much as we pretend to hate the Labor Party, we've actually got far more in common with them than we have with these pesky Greens. Um, let's do a deal to work together to make sure these Greens never get back into the lower house again. So there's the experience. There's that connection with community. But I think probably the thing that uh, I most admire about Kathleen is her principle and integrity. And when you look at not only the work that she's done on council, but you look at her experience working for women's health, but also perhaps most prominently that fantastic work and successful campaigns that have helped change the way people think about trafficking and the action that we take on trafficking. And you compare that against the careerists and no-hopers that we've got in Parliament at the moment and that sit there taking up space, like, I know who I would much rather have as my local representative. And one of the things that, uh, that I still can't quite understand about Victorian politics is that uh, when it comes to issues of principle and equality, come every election, gender always seems to be up for debate in this state and always seems to be something that... Um, politicians feel like they can use to play to the lowest denominator to win vote. And we're seeing it being played out in Frankston at the moment. Um, what better thing could we have in Parliament, especially given the challenges that the state is facing at the moment, than someone who is going to stand for equality on principle, no matter what? And I feel absolutely confident in knowing that no matter what pressure she was put under, that she would stand firm on the principle of equality. And that is something that I don't think we could say about many other members of the lower house of state parliament at the moment. <laughs> and if that hasn't been enough of a reason to get out and campaign to ensure that we have history made in November, then I'm sure the next speaker is going to convince you. It is my absolute, absolute pleasure to not only endorse, but to now introduce the next member for Richmond, Kathleen. <laughs> Thank you, Adam.
that very generous introduction and more importantly, thank you for the way you represent us in Parliament. I know that we all really appreciate it. It is amazing to be here tonight and to feel the buzz in the room. I've been excited about this election for a fair while now, but this is something else. It's encouraging and inspiring and exciting to feel the warmth, literally, <laughs> but also figuratively, and the determination in the room. And it really means a lot to me and I know to everyone else who's been working hard for tonight. So thank you for coming out on a Friday night where you could be relaxing somewhere else. And I want to start by talking a little bit about why I'm here tonight. At 18, I moved into my first share house, a not quite typical three-bedroom flat in North Fitzroy. I was a volunteer living with other people my age who were coming out of the local youth refuge with the idea that I would be some sort of model of independent living. If they'd acquitted my mum about my independent vacuuming skills, they might not have taken me. <laughs> but as it was, I moved into the Office of Housing walk-ups in Holden Street, North Fitzroy, and met my new housemate, Kylie. Kylie moved in with a garbage bag with her clothes, and like me, her baby photos, which she kept in a box. But unlike me, her baby photos were the evidentiary photos that were used to take her into state care because of the injuries they showed. I couldn't accept then, and that I can't accept now, that this is the best we can do. She spent a childhood in the so-called care of the state, adding very little to that box that she brought with her, and emerged at 18 funny, energetic, smarter than me in every possible way, homeless, and on the path to addiction. As I say, I couldn't accept then what I saw in her life, but I wasn't seeing anything that could explain it to me. I was studying politics at Melbourne Uni, but I wasn't reading anything that could explain not just why that was possible, but how it could be changed. So I set out trying to find out on a path that took me from Fitzroy to the Philippines and back. When the brothel at 417 Brunswick Street, Fitzroy, just down the road, was raided by the federal police, in 2003, I wasn't surprised. I knew that brothel. In the Philippines, I'd learned about trafficking in women for prostitution up close, and I found it here too when I came home, first through newspaper articles, and then when I decided to do something about it and set up Project Respect in the brothels that I visited, including 417 Brunswick Street. Women in the sex industry, customers, and government officials had all told me the same story and said that those women were trafficked. They were typ typical of trafficked women across this country. Women who were threatened, raped, beaten, told that their parents and their kids at home would be punished if they didn't obey the traffickers. But when I started, very few people were doing anything about the issue. No organisations were speaking out. And so I was pretty much on my own. I started knocking on all sorts of doors, talking to pimps and politicians and police, and bit by bit, drawing in people who wanted to push for change. I spent many, many hours with trafficked women, finding out what they needed, what they wanted, and supporting them to make their voices heard. Often very unexpected people came al became allies, those same brothel owners, liberal politicians, hardened police. And I learnt through that to put my prejudices aside and work with anyone who would listen. I learned to assess what was essential and couldn't be compromised and what could be given away. I learned to devise real world solutions that policymakers would listen to and could see could be implemented. And in time, we developed a strong core of dedicated adv advocates, and there are a few of them in the room tonight. And we mapped out a whole new way for dealing with trafficking. And it worked. We got the law changed. We stopped women being deported. We won support services for women. 
and we finally pushed the police to investigate. The raid on 417 Brunswick Street was a direct result of those changes and it was vindicated when the High Court of Australia said that brothel was a site of slavery. We fought and we won. But why talk about stuff like that on a Friday night? Looking at justice, we all know, can be painful. But for me, it is impossible to accept that injustice is inevitable. And I know that when you refuse to look away, you can change it. This is what the Greens do. And this is why we are here tonight. I share these stories because each of us has experiences like that, don't we? That punch through our lives where we say this is not right. We can do better than this. We are better than this. And if we're lucky, we have defining experiences too where unlikely though it might seem, we fight and we win. Federal politics are the glamorous side of the political family tree, <laughs> I have to grant. But state politics touch and shape our lives in powerful and intimate ways, in the day-to-day -day and in the intimate. I just repeated intimate, didn't I? <laughs> in the day-to-day -day and life and death. When you look to the police to protect you or to the courts for justice, it's a state government at work. When there is more money on budget day for new prison beds than hospital beds, it's the state government. When a kid like Kylie and thousands, since her, end up homeless because of state care, that's the state government. When the train's late in the morning and crushingly full in the afternoon, state government. The state government builds the tollways and we can make them not build them. Yeah. <laughs> the state government determines how clean our air should be, how loud our live music is allowed to be, and whether we fell our forests for wood chips or keep them for future generations. State laws trump councils when they try to protect what their communities love as I found out too many times on Yarra Council for all the good work that we did on Council. The state government can protect what we love. It's a state government that can promote renewables or regulate wind farms out of existence. It can close coal mines and ban coal sand gas. The state government shapes our lives. Imagine a different sort of state government. A state government built on the values of justice and compassion, of respect for learning and creativity, love for this land that we live on, and passion that change for the better is possible. Imagine taking those values into the balance of power. Four years ago, who would have imagined that an anti-abortion, born again, ex-liberal, independent, would hold the fate of our parliament in his hands, and yet, Jeff Shaw. <laughs> Imagine if instead of subsidising dirty coal, treating gas as a renewable energy, and banning wind farms, the next state government set up a solar bank where ordinary people could have low interest loans that would put solar panels on their roof and bring down both carbon emissions and their energy bills at the same time. Imagine. Instead of new prisons, hospitals. <coughs> Instead of TAFE cuts, investment. Instead of the Premier handballing grants to his mates, our fears and fearless anti-corruption commission. Imagine if instead of letting the Coalition and the Labor Party ram through a dirty great road that we don't want and can't afford, we negotiated to get those contracts ripped up and put the money instead where it's needed. I reckon there might be some suggestions in this room of what we might be able to do with $16 billion if we didn't waste it on that road. Yeah. 
imagine making that our reality. So, all we have to do is win. <laughs> and the good news is, as Adam said, that's possible. The numbers are very clear. There are more than enough people, as Adam has said, who have already voted Greens in this area, including just last September, for us to win again in November if they were to vote for us again. But we don't own those votes. Thankfully, this is not a seat where people back a party and vote for them unthinkingly. In this seat, thoughtful, politically savvy people decide on their vote election to election, like us. They're passionate about policy and they value our vote, they value their vote. If we can reach out to our community, listen to them, tell them what's at stake and make a credible case for why we can make a difference, we can persuade them. So what do we do, have to do to do that? We won't get much media coverage this election. We can't match the old party's mail outs, as Adam said, yet or their ads or their glossy brochures. With their big business donations, they will outspend us in every way. But we know that the best way for us to, meet, to reach people is face to face, by knocking on their doors and sitting down with them on separate occasions, not the same time necessarily, around their kitchen tables. And if we do that again and again, we will win. We win our first ever seat in the Legislative Assembly, or better still, our first two with Ellen from Melbourne, or three with Tim, who I can't see now, <laughs> Tim from Brunswick, four with David. Yeah. Richmond is already a powerful history-making seat, not just since Adams wins in 2010 and 13. The people of Richmond have been making history for well over a century. When the Melbourne Uni stonemasons walked off the job in 1856 and set off the unstoppable campaign for their eight hour day, they marched straight to the Belvedere Hotel in Brunswick Street, Fitzroy. Yeah. Our own party started under a tree in Clifton Hill in the Darling Gardens. The very first Greens mayor in the country came from here, the city of Yarra. Greg Barber, now the leader of the Victorian Greens. And as you know, because you put him there, Adam Band from here is now the deputy leader of the, Victor of the Australian Greens. What, <laughs> what starts in this seat shapes the state and the nation. This is where change starts. This election, we can reach, reshape Victoria. So. At 18, confronted by the injustice in Kylie's life, I have to say I felt overwhelmed and powerless. Working on trafficking, I saw that you could make a difference. I'm here tonight because of people like Kylie. I'm here because of climate change. I'm here because of that dirty, great road. I'm here because I know, as you do, the change we need. And I'm here because I know, as you do, that if we fight, we can win. And when I look at this room and see all of you, I think there's nowhere else that I would rather be. Nothing else that I would rather do. And no one else I would rather do it with than you, because this is where change starts. Right now. Let's get started. The next member for Richmond, Kathleen Bolton. Uh, my name's Gahute, I was Adam Bant's lead organiser for the federal election last year uh, and I'm here tonight um, a little bit nervous, uh, I've done a lot of these uh, speaking events but I'm nervous because I have so much respect and love for Kathleen um, that I really want to do a good job and inspire you all and make you get out there and do great things because she's bloody awesome. Uh I've worked in the community sector all my life pretty much and when you look at what's happening with the Abbott government and also when you look at things like the threats to public housing with this government, I guess I have a real sense that people who are vulnerable are treated as dispensable and 
I guess that very early experience of mine as a teenager showed me both the price of that um, disdain for people's lives and also um, the wrongness of that. I just think it's impossible to live in a country as wealthy of, as this and accept that some people fall by the wayside. And I don't believe in a politics that is focused on, say, just the economy and is not looking at the people who are most vulnerable in the community. So I suppose I wanted to tell that story to put people who are having a hard time front and centre in our politics and not as some afterthought. Look, I think there are three really important things at the moment. I think climate change is an absolutely pressing issue and we're seeing the federal government walking away from all the progress of the last years and the state government not rising to the challenge. And so I think it is a crucial issue. Connected to that, I think the East-West Tunnel is a really big issue in this community, not simply because it will rip into our streets, but also because $16 billion spent on that tollway is money not going into the community. And that links into the third issue of social justice. And I don't think we can divide them can't talk about climate change without addressing social justice. The East-West Tollway is a sign of all that's wrong, both on the environment and on the quality issues. So I'll be looking at those three issues particularly. And so what are those, what are the, do you think the core issues are in all you're doing, I think? So we're spending a lot of time asking people what they think about the East-West link. I think the... Is it going to affect people in your area? Totally. Um, the, what people are really mad about is that you cannot squeeze onto the 55 tram. Uh, oh, yeah, there's yeah. almost no room on the number one tram or the number yeah. 96. So they're the, they're the three north-south trams yeah, running I through Brunswick. Yeah, I catch the 96 a lot. Yeah. And the um, upfield train line, yeah. the trains run about every 17 or 18 minutes at peak hour yeah. and less frequently between times. Yeah. Um, so not only is the East-West Link going to just pull the funding out of any chance of improving those things, it's actually going to cut those lines off for who knows how long, a couple of years. Uh, a lot of people in Brunswick are going to be walking to work. Yeah, because uh, so what they'll do is they'll dig up Parkville and all those tram, the number 55 tram, I was thinking, up, yeah, that's through the guts of the House of yeah, Sea. Yeah. That's terrible. So that's a big issue. Got a lot of students in the area yeah. who are mad as hell about how much their degree is going to cost. Yeah, true. Um, one of our big points is going to be just telling people enrol to vote. Um, I grew up on a permaculture farm, so, um, so I know a lot about the environmental side of things. Um, I'm still a bit fuzzy on, the green, on some of the green economic policies. Like I know it says on the website um, that they want to support small businesses, but I don't know the specific. I don't know the specific policies. Um, like, That's right, you definitely don't have to be a policy whiz to do this. I mean, no one expects you to yeah. volunteer. Um, it's just about more about the message of what the Greens represent, which is, in your case, your story is that you really want to support the environment and stop politicians from destroying it and take responsibility for it, then that's more the message that's important rather than the specific policies. People vote on principle, I think, rather than... I think um, details. I think there's not enough of a choice between the major parties yeah. anymore. I think so too. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm supporting Kathleen for election to the seat of Richmond. Um, I know Kathleen personally, and she's such a fantastic community campaigner. But I also know that she'll stand up for what matters to me and what matters to this electorate, um, and most importantly, what is best for the state of Victoria. Um, she's uh, a terrific hu human rights and um, a quality advocate. Uh, but most importantly, I really think that she's principled and that uh, she'll definitely stand up in the parliament for what really matters. I support Kathleen because I'm inspired by her commitment to social justice. I think she's got a great history of campaigning to improve our society and help the most disadvantaged people in our society. I support Kathleen and the Greens in the wider general spectrum of things because I really care about issues like climate change and I want to know that when I'm older and I have children that I can tell them that I did everything possible to make things better on this planet and I wasn't that person who used every last excuse to not do something. So that's why I'm here tonight and that's why I support the Greens. Kathleen really cares about people and communities and I've come from working in the community sector and in the TAFE sector as well and I know that uh, Kathleen 
really wants to stand up uh, for vulnerable people, like young people, people on pensions, students, and um, put funding back into public institutions like TAFE. I think this is a really exciting time in Victorian politics. We're seeing both how important state government is when the federal government goes feral, but also the parliament is so finely balanced that any change in a place like Richmond or Frankston could rebalance the parliament and we could get a very different outcome. And so people's votes are incredibly important in this area, which I think is great.